One of the most spectacularly successful public health measures in recent years has been the fluoridation of water supplies. The benefits of fluoride were discovered using epidemiological methods, and since it's been in use, the amount of tooth decay in communities with fluoride in their water has dropped tremendously. This drop has forced a change in the role of the dentist, whose services are now more preventive than curative. This has all happened with very little money being spent. The cost of adding fluoride powder to the water supply is minimal, but results in a tremendous saving to the community in the cost of dental care, as well as a huge advance in well-being and comfort from all those who benefit from not having teeth like these. That's one of the huge advantages of preventive public health measures, as against the development of high-tech, hospital-based curative medicine. Public health measures can benefit an enormous number of people at a very low cost per head, while high-tech curative medicine can help a few people at enormously high cost per head. And public health measures don't necessarily need to be medically based. Take legislation designed to reduce alcohol consumption in drivers, for example. No medicine in that but the effect on public health has been very considerable. Sometimes uh, things can change quite quickly. I think the story of car smash deaths here in Victoria is a real success story. You had information from epidemiologists, you had the involvement and commitment of the doctors who were working to try and treat people who were injured, namely the Australian College of Surgeons. You had the press involved. Within a you had a raising of public consciousness, a change in public attitudes, with the change in public attitudes, you had new laws, seatbelt laws and so on. And within a decade, the number of deaths had fallen by half. And if you expressed the deaths in relation to the number of vehicles on the road, it had fallen, in fact, by 60% in, in 10 years. Now, that's a real success story. January of this year, when the O5 came in, I was on call most of January because of other people having holidays. And I left a lot of time for theatre to patch up people that you'd expect to be involved in motor vehicle accidents and needing things done. And it was absolutely dramatic in that month that there were no cases to do. I mean, there were a few, but nowhere near the number. And in fact, we had lists going empty or calling in routine cases to fill in the theatre time because they just, they just weren't there. The cases just weren't involved. The kinds of injuries they're suffering are far less, whereas before someone might have three major fractures in both legs. They might now only have one, or that one won't be compound, whereas before it was, the skin was broken, or before we'd have a lot of trouble with bone healing because there's so much force involved that the bone would die. That's not happening so much now. I think that people are healing up quicker, if you like, because people aren't driving as fast or as recklessly or hitting the poles as fast as they used to. If the well-being of the public can be improved enormously by such relatively simple measures as putting fluoride in water and legislating against drinking drivers, why isn't preventive medicine practiced more widely in this country? One of the reasons lies in the fact that sometimes individuals may stand to suffer economically by the introduction of measures like these. Since random uh, breath testing in 0.05 was introduced in January, uh, surveys conducted by the Australian Hotels Association indicate that there has been a consistent loss of business right through the uh, hotel and the hospitality industry of some 15 to 20 per cent. And uh, this has been indicative of uh, running through from uh, take-home package market to uh, food market to bar market. And uh, in itself, it has cost some 3,000 jobs in the hotel sector of the industry throughout Australia. The same sort of political problem applies, but to a larger extent, with tobacco. Tobacco companies are large employers, large earners, and large taxpayers. Direct cigarette advertising on television has been banned, but tobacco companies continue to use their money and political strength to maintain a high profile in indirect TV advertising through sports sponsorship. Sporting sponsorship has three effects. It, it gives them um, 
connection with the excellence of sport and culture, that sort of thing, that they weren't able to get in their ordinary advertising because of the self-regulatory rules. It also gives them access to television in ways that they never had before. It's been estimated that over 40,000 shots of the Benson Hedges brand logo were shown on television in the 1980-81 cricket season. And that just couldn't have been bought uh, with money if, if advertising were allowed. But I think the, the third and most sinister effect of, of all is that they've been able to buy the silence of a constituency. Uh, and I speak here of sporting uh, heroes, especially sporting heroes of the young. Uh, so we see the spectacle of uh, members of the Australian cricket team, for example, coming out and actually supporting the tobacco industry in their fights with the health uh, lobby. And uh, I think this is a, a deplorable situation where you have people who should be involved in promoting health by their activities actually going hand in hand with the tobacco industry because they're financially dependent upon them. It'll reach a point very soon, I think, if it hasn't reached it already, that sporting administrators are blithely accepting tobacco money in all the uh, celebratory atmosphere that surrounds, you know, getting a big deal from a tobacco company, will be forced to think again because public opinion will be such that they will be frankly embarrassed to be seen to be associating with an industry like that. I've been working in this area myself for about four or five years and I've seen remarkable changes in that time in public opinion. I think that probably many of the health ministers around the country personally feel very committed to uh, introducing legislative changes in this area, but of course there are only one, one person in cabinet. They have to convince their cabinet colleagues that such a step is in tune with public opinion. And I think that it's there that groups like the cancer societies, the doctors, the consumer associations and so forth are creating groundswells of public opinion which just cannot be ignored.